Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me here once again. If you're someone who enjoys listening to horror stories, and this is your first time here, join us by clicking subscribe down below. I upload new stories every single night. Also, before we get started, please leave a like on today's video to show your support. Thank you. Let's begin. The moment he closed those car doors, it was the end of my so-called freedom. My name's Tanya, I'm 18 years old, and I've only been using Tinder for around 3 months. I wasn't a girl that liked being alone, I crave attention, I love always having a boyfriend or a relationship, I don't have many friends, a few years ago I fell out with my best friends, and we've never seen each other since, or ever spoken to each other. It was over boys. She tried to steal my boyfriend, and she actually managed to, so I just stopped talking to her, and obviously cut him out of my life completely. Most of the relationships in my life have been pretty shallow. I guess you could say I'm pretty naive. I'm gullible. I fall for things that I shouldn't, because deep down, I want to have someone with me. I don't want to be alone. Okay, I have abandonment issues. There, I said it. Happy? My dad was never in my life, and my mum, she wasn't that great. But I don't really want to talk about her, because this experience doesn't really have much to do with her, and there's nothing she could have done to help in the moment. When I started using Tinder, I had turned 18. I'd only been 18 for around a week, and I couldn't wait to start getting some guys into my life. It sounds stupid, but I just wanted to be protected. I'm not a girl that wants to sleep around. I just want to be with a guy, so I feel like I'm protected, and I will never get into trouble. It's funny I say that now. Because what happened to me was the very opposite of what I wanted to happen. Great. This is why I now have severe trust issues as well as abandonment issues. Tanya, 18, about to get in a car with a guy she's only met over Tinder. And somehow in her little stupid mind, she thought that this guy was her next Mr. Handsome. Her next Superman. She didn't realise that what was going to happen was the most terrifying experience of her entire existence. We decided to meet up. It was kind of spontaneous. In fact, it was only three days after we'd matched. He instigated the meet up and asked me if he wanted to come to a party with me. I said yes, but I was a little hesitant at first. Yes, even me, I know. Why? because I didn't like being around loads of people. That might sound a bit controversial or stupid, judging the fact that I've just said the stuff at the beginning. But, I just wanted to be with him on his own. I didn't like the idea of being around other girls, having to dress up and put stuff on and wear makeup. I would have rather have gone on a date with him on his own, but I guess this guy just wanted a girl to take with him to the party. I was willing to take what I could get, so I figured I could just have a good time, maybe try and socialise, and stay around him if I could. When I got to his car down my drive, he looked exactly like his photos, which one was a good start, but two also meant that this guy was way older than me, he was in his late 20s, and I felt kind of wrong, if that even makes sense to be even going with him on this date. Put yourself in his position, y'all. What the hell was this guy thinking? Did he not realise how people were going to judge him if he went to a party with a girl who is 18, looked 14, and he's 28? Clearly he didn't care, which was kind of weird at first. I didn't realise this was the first red flag that I totally missed. The second red flag was when I ran down to his car. No, I'm not joking. I actually ran, I was so excited. 
I gave him a hug and almost leaped into his arms. I found it kind of cute. He had big arms, which was hot. My mum was watching out the window. I guess she was just trying to be protective. She was worried, and when I told her what I was doing, she tried to stop me. We had a bit of an argument, which didn't exactly end well. But at the end of the day, I was an adult, so I could do what I wanted. I promised that I'd keep her updated, I'd text her and bring her if I needed her help. But it turns out that wouldn't help with anything, because I couldn't even get to my phone when I needed it the most. Other than his massive strong arms, the second thing I noticed was how much he was smiling. It was kind of forced and over the top. I couldn't understand why he was keeping eye contact for so long, with that weird, forced, overstretched grin. I looked at him and kind of laughed, because at first I thought he was pulling funny faces, to kind of joke at me. He looked up at my mum, who was looking through the living room window, straight at us. I turned around and sensed some weird vibe going on, as if he didn't like the fact that she was watching. We got in the car, we drove to the party, and this was it. The party was exactly how I had imagined it to be. It was boring, I knew nobody, and he got a bunch of weird looks for having a girl that was clearly almost half his age, or at least looked it. We came to the realisation that the longer we stay, the worse things were going to get. When people do alcohol, their good old political correctness and their kindness, or fake kindness, tends to just vanish into thin air. So, we made an escape while we could, and while we got all the way outside, we just had a breather. He kissed me a bit, and I remember him still doing that weird smile. He asked me if I wanted to come back to his, to which I replied, not today, but maybe another night. I tried to sound nice and kind, but I could tell he was kind of annoyed by what I said. We both got back in the car, and I remember, up until this point on the date, he'd been so nice to me. He'd taken care of me, he'd got me drinks, and he'd basically stayed with me the whole time inside the person's house where the party was being held. But the one time that he shut his driver's side door, leaving the house, is when his whole attitude changed in a split second. He locked the car doors, and then just looked at me and said, Nah, you'll be alright. You're coming to mine. My jaw dropped, and I said to him, No, I'm sorry. I really have to get home, because I need to help my mum with some work tomorrow. It's early. To which he replies, Oh, that's okay. We can just wake up early. All good. Okay. Text her or something. I don't know what to say to that, and I'm genuinely lost for words for a whole three or four minutes, as he's driving in a direction that I don't even know clearly his own house. I started trying to call my mum, and then I got her to pick up. She was obviously asleep and sounded super rough and groggy. I told her that I was going to be going to the guy's house, but I tried to say a code word that I thought she'd remember. A code word that meant, I'm in a lot of trouble. Talking in a certain tone just doesn't do it, and unless the person is somehow a genius, they're never going to pick up on it. My mum didn't, and the fact that she was in the middle of a deep sleep probably didn't help, as it was 3.30 in the morning. So, I'm in the car, I have no idea what to do. I'm basically a passenger slash prisoner. I decide to turn to this guy and say, Can you please drive me home? I don't want to go to yours. I have to help my mum tomorrow. Please. He ignores everything I say and just continues to keep driving. In fact, a few more minutes pass, and he turns the radio up. So I knew that I didn't really have a say in the situation. It made me feel small, and it made me feel extremely uncomfortable. We pull up to this apartment complex. His car just runs parallel with the sidewalk, slows down, and then out of nowhere, he stalls a car. I have no idea why or how. His car is pretty old, it's stick shift, and for some reason, he just, well, he just messed up badly. The guy was pretty distraught, he was angry and frustrated with why I didn't want to go there, 
and now he had taken the idea of forcing me to go as somehow the best option. He only unlocks his side so he gets out and I can't run off. Not that I plan to. That wouldn't get me very far, I knew that. Then he comes round to my side, the passenger door, opens up the door and asks me to give him my wrist. Okay, a little creepy. I give him my wrist and he grabs it tightly, basically pulls me out the car and then slams the door shut, locking the car behind us. He then drags me by my wrist back to his apartment, which was up three flights of steps and on the third floor. I walked most of the way, of course he didn't drag me along the ground, he wasn't that angry, but during the way I was crying and I really was scared for what I was about to go through. He brought me up to the apartment and before we made it to his door, there was a lady who was around mid 40s. She saw me and this lady was my angel, my guardian angel, my lifeline, God himself. Because she saw that I was crying. Now bear in mind it was four in the morning. So what were the chances of this lady even being out in the corridor of the third floor of this apartment complex? They were small. But there she was. She looked me right in the eye and saw that I had been crying. She saw that I was uncomfortable and did not want to go into this apartment with this guy. She stepped right in and asked me if I was okay. The guy got really frustrated, let me go and just slammed the door shut. He realized that he was in big trouble now. The lady called the police for me, and I told the officer everything that happened. They arrested my date and took him away. The guy ended up trying to force me into his own apartment for god knows what reasons. People suspect they know it, but you don't always know. What if he wasn't just after love? What if he was going to kill me? Do something? Who knows? I remember when he locked me in that car. I couldn't get out. I couldn't even try to if I wanted. It was a scary moment for me and it's something I always reflect on whenever I get bored or somehow annoyed with life. What if that lady, the lady who saved my life, hadn't have been in the corridor at the third floor? We would have just walked straight in. I wouldn't have stood a chance fighting back against this guy. He was way stronger than me and it would have been over. I would have had to endure something horrible either way. I know that. I just know within my soul. The lady, whose name was Jane, ended up saving my life. At least that's how I see it. I'm so grateful for this lady that I could quite literally give her my soul. And that wouldn't even be enough payment. Thank you so much, Jane. I really appreciate what you did for me. And as for the guy, I have no idea where he is. And I don't want to know. You wouldn't believe what an unforgettable night I just had. I matched with a guy, we'll call him Jack. He was cute in that, quote, I kinda look like a model, but I'm actually just a regular dude, way. Curly hair, good smile, six foot four, and it felt like I already knew him from somewhere, except he kept on saying how he definitely didn't go to my high school, but for some reason in the back of my mind, I thought he did. After a few messages back and forth, he sent me a message saying, quote, come chill with me. In retrospect, I should have seen it as a classic line that guys throw out when they don't know what else to say, but something about the way he wrote it made me hopeful. <laughs> I'm joking. Maybe it's just the fact that he was six for four. Sorry. 
I agreed to come over. It was a stupid idea, but it was the thrill and excitement of meeting this guy, the fact that he was dropped at gorgeous, and the fact we had only just started talking. He had a little place located on the second floor of a nondescript building. The hallway smelled vaguely of old pizza and laundry detergent, and as I approached his door, I felt that familiar mix of excitement and nerves. Would he be a nice person in real life? Would we click? Or would I be stuck in an awkward silence over a cold of cold cup of soda? He opened the door before I could knock, and my nerves began to dissipate the moment I saw him. Hey, look at you, he said, his face lighting up with a welcome smile. I stepped inside and the first thing that struck me was how warm and inviting his apartment felt. It was cosy, filled with mismatched furniture and strobe lights that hung from the ceiling. I could tell that he took care to make it feel homely. There were framed pictures of friends and family, and there were some cute houseplants sitting by the window. As we settled onto the couch, I felt pretty comfortable with where I was at. He was a nice guy, and I guess he was really six foot four. We started talking about things, just basic things like small talk. Jack was funny, he was easy to talk to, and it was pretty effortless to just keep things going. We shared a few laughs, and I could feel the chemistry between us. After a while, Jack walked to the kitchen and offered me something to drink. Water? Juice? Soda? I think I might have some juice somewhere, he said, rummaging around through his thridge, and finally pulling out a soda. Here you go, so tell me more about yourself, he said, sitting down on the couch right beside me. I started drinking and began to share more about my life. After a few more minutes of back and forth talking, I started to feel a bit anxious. Perhaps it was the soda or something wrong with me. I began to feel the urge to use the bathroom. Hey, where's your bathroom? I asked. Down the hall, first door on the left, he replied. Thanks, I said, standing up and trying to smooth my dress as I headed in the direction that he pointed. The hall was full of posters of bands that I didn't recognise and a few more potted plants. Each step took me deeper into the unknown and I could hear Jack's laughter echoing from the living room beside me. I wondered if I was entering a trap of sorts, a weird protagonist versus villain film scenario, where the bathroom would turn out to be an escape room of horror. I pushed the bathroom door open, and was met with a nondescript space, crisp white tiles, and a little vintage charm. However, my stomach started trying to regurgitate itself the moment I took in the sight before me. Unfortunately, quote-unquote clean isn't how I'd describe it. The toilet was unflushed. Oh no, but worse than that, there was mess, dash, poo, smeared across the walls near the toilet. I started gagging and I still couldn't fully process what I was seeing. The disgust of it settled in me, and I started to gag even more. Before I knew it, I felt nauseous to the point where I couldn't even stand up properly, and had to sit down on the edge of the bath. I pressed my hands to my mouth, but it was too late. I could feel the bile rising, and an involuntary gag echoed in the small space. I stood up, stumbled forward, trying to catch my breath, but my body had other plans. I leaned over the sink, and everything I'd managed to enjoy that evening was swiftly expelled into the porcelain. It was horrifying, yet almost comical, a gory scene victimising my desire for lovely date. The sound of my retching probably echoed against the tar walls, so he could hear everything. Well, that's probably the least embarrassing thing right now. Why was there pool up his tiles? No one knows. 
What kind of guy had the audacity to invite someone over to such a disaster? And what did this say about him? Surely he noticed. Would I just emerge from the bathroom, casually pretending that this never happened? Would he have heard me gagging and come to my rescue? Or would he think I was the worst date ever? Nothing made sense. His whole apartment was as clean as a science lab trying to bring the cure for a disease. Yet his bathroom? It was like a homeless person had used it. After the wave of nausea passed and I convinced myself to stop looking at all smeared on the tiles, I found myself frantically trying to clean up the evidence. Why? I don't know. I felt bad for Jack. I reached for a roll of toilet paper next to the sink, however upon touching it, the dampness told me that it was already compromised. Great. I rummaged through cupboards, discovering some cleaning supplies that wouldn't be enough to erase the magnitude of the scene in front of me. Quote, nope, not happening. <sighs> How do I get out of this? I said to myself while sighing. With shaking hands, I reached for my phone and debated my next steps. I could text him saying, Hey, um, I'm sorry, but I need to leave. But my pride wouldn't let me give that excuse. No, the lines of my heart and morals battled within me. I didn't want to run, and I secretly liked the idea for the romantic potential between us. But if this was how he kept his bathroom... No way. Taking a deep breath, I decided to exit the bathroom, prepared to face the unexpected turn to my evening. As I stepped back into the hallway, every fibre of my being was shouting, Leave! But my feet were oddly glued in place. Jack was still on the couch, laughing at some TikToks, apparently oblivious to what I had just been through. I walked back into the living room, forcing a smile, even as I felt my heart race with anxiety. Everything okay? Jack asked, looking up with those eyes, curious as hell. Yeah, just, um, a little mishap with the sink, I replied, pr praying he would buy it. The lie tasted bitter on my tongue, but I didn't know what else to say. Oh no, did you need a towel or something? He said concerned yet unaware of the situation. No, no, I'm fine. It's all good. Thank you. I insisted. I was feeling very uncomfortable at this point, because if he got up to look and found that, and it was actually someone else, then yeah, that's real bad luck for him. We needed a distraction. Maybe I could change the subject. Want to watch a movie? I blurted out desperate to try and get his attention away from going to the toilet. Sure, I've got some great ones lined up. Do you like comedy or horror? He asked. Horror, I responded. I was relieved to get him to stop thinking about the bathroom. At least I could now focus on something other than my current internal crisis. He navigated through his collection picking out a flick I had actually seen before, so I played up my excitement, all while silently wishing away the horrid bathroom situation from my mind's eye. As the movie began, we both settled back into the couch, and I felt a sense of intimacy growing, despite the fact that there was crap smeared all over the tiles of his bathroom. <laughs> For the next hour or so, I tried not to laugh, I tried not to do anything stupid. I leaned in close enough to share the popcorn and engage with his funny jokes and comments on the film. Somehow, as the credits began to roll, I realised that I had managed to momentarily evade disaster. We ended up sharing genuine laughter, and for a moment, it felt like I had just not experienced what I had. I went home that day, never heard anything about the bathroom from him on Tinder or on text, so he definitely saw it and either thought it was me, <laughs> or he just realised it was him and actually didn't care. But that wouldn't make much sense. When you compare the rest of his apartment to the bathroom, it just didn't add up.
My theory, if you even want to hear it, is that he has a housemate. The housemate left it in that state, and then he didn't realize. It's either that or he has an ex-girlfriend that hates him, and she did that as a way to get me to not like him, and he didn't realize. What do you guys think? I finally decided to do this. It's been a long six years since my Tinder date with Derek, and perhaps writing it all out will help me untangle the mess that has been my life since then. I haven't told anyone the full story, and maybe it's time to release the burden of this nightmare. I was 28, freshly single after a long, draining relationship. A friend had convinced me to give Tinder a try, because apparently that's what people do when they're back in the dating pool. I was sceptical at first, the stories I had heard, but I was curious and a little adventurous, so I made my profile, swiped a few times, and then I finally matched with a guy named Derek. We talked for a bit, he said all the right things, etc. I became en and with his tales of adventure and life experiences, Perhaps looking back, I should have seen the early signs. The way he needed constant validation, the slight edge of possessiveness in his voice when we sent voice notes. But I was blinded by it. Our first date was great. We went to a little place to grab some food. He held the door open for me, pulled out my chair, and for the first time in ages, I felt someone really cared. As we shared plates of pasta, the chemistry crackled in the air, and by the end of the night, I was convinced I had met someone special. But it didn't take long before the charming act began to crack. We went out a few more times, and I noticed the shifts in his mood. Once, after I mentioned a casual dinner with my parents, the jovial spark in his eyes just went out. He asked if I could rearrange my plans. I thought it was sweet at first that he wanted to spend more time with me, but in hindsight, he was already beginning to show signs of controlliveness. As weeks turned into months, the relationship quickly changed from fun and happy to overwhelming in all the wrong ways. Derek began making demands disguised as suggestions. We should only hang out on weekends, we should limit who we interact with. I was a people pleaser by nature, often prioritizing others' happiness over my own, so I acquiesced. I stopped responding to friends' messages, and I began tailoring my life around his needs and expectations. In my heart, I still knew my family came first, so I couldn't completely shut them out. Derek did seem supportive at first, even coming to family dinners but beneath the surface, there was a growing tension. The first real alarm bell rang at my sister's wedding. He was cordial enough, but I caught him glaring at other people when they talked to me. When my cousin offered a simple compliment about my dress, I swear I could feel the temperature drop. I brushed it off that night, attributing it to nerves, but deep down, a part of me felt really uneasy. As the years passed, Derek transformed into a shadow, one that loomed over every aspect of my life. At first, I thought it was merely an intense romance, but then came the obsessive texts and phone calls. I remember once I took a weekend trip to visit a friend in the city. He'd gone ballistic when I casually mentioned I'd be spending time with her. Quote, What's wrong with you? He shouted over the phone, quote, Do you think I'm just going to sit here while you party without me? 
That weekend, he bombarded me with 38 calls, some threatening. Quote, I'm warning you, don't do this to me. It was terrifying, and yet I went back. I believed in the good times, the laughter, the charm, and dismissed the alarming behavior as simply jealousy. I wish I could have realized sooner how dangerous this love could become. My family became the next target. He would manipulate my parents during those rare gatherings, planting seeds of doubt about my choices and subtly casting himself as a saviour. Quote, I just want what's best for your daughter, he'd say, while behind the smooth smile was something darker. Mum and Dad sensed that something was wrong and grew protective, telling me that the intensity of our relationship wasn't healthy. I would ignore their concerns, throw them away, as queens do, dismissing them with phrases like, you don't know him like I do. The reality was slowly cracking through my sunlit delusions. Over the next year, the messages turned into a flood. Where are you? I miss you. Are you with someone else? The frantic nature of the text sapped my energy, eclipsing the fond memory I had of him. I started turning my phone off at night, I began locking the doors more often. What was wrong with me? Why couldn't I just end it? On borrowed strength, I finally got the courage to break up with him, but he didn't take the news well. That night, I received a strange knock on the door. My heart was pounding as I looked through the peephole, and there he was. He had been lurking in the shadows, I called the police, while he pounded on my door, yelling desperate promises. I love you, I didn't mean it, you'll regret this. The cops arrived shortly thereafter, calming the situation for a scant moment. They escorted him away, but instead of feeling relief, I felt sick. It was like a predator had been driven away but I knew it was only a matter of time before he would return. That was just the beginning, and the game of cat and mouse escalated in ways that were utterly horrifying. I thought moving away would help. I packed my belongings and took a job across the country, convincing myself I could escape the grip of fear, but it only set the stage for his relentless pursuit. He found me. It was like a cruel twist of fate. Within days of moving, I received a package at my new address. Inside were mementos from our time together. Old tickets to concerts, photos of us, trinkets I'd given him. My heart sank as I recognized the pattern. He had followed me, stalked my social media for clues, a reminder that I couldn't run from him. Then there were the letters. They began slipping under my door, handwritten notes of professing love and devotion. But they were mixed with disgusting threats. Quote, you're mine, and no one will take you away from me. You'll love me again. Each letter was a mixture of devotion and madness, and it sent shivers down my spine. I stopped answering calls, stopped responding to friends, and I became a recluse in my own life. My family became embroiled in his obsession as well. On one particularly dreadful evening, my parents visited unannounced. They expressed their concern over my increasingly paranoid behaviour, and fearing for their safety, I told them everything. Mum cried, Dad's face contorted, pledging to protect me no matter what. That night, a bright light flickered on in the backyard, the first sign that Derek was nearby. We called the police again, and to my horror, the responding officers found a note taped to my front door, quote, I can see you. After that, I focused intently on staying vigilant and rebuilding a semblance of my life. I started seeing a therapist, seeking support from others who had experienced similar circumstances. But it only worked for so long. 
after six terrifying years of living in fear, I reached my breaking point. I filed a restraining order. My life felt stifling and dark, but I knew I had to take action. I had come this far and couldn't back down. The day of the court hearing was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. My hands shook as I recounted my life with Derek to the judge. The fear, the anxiety, the terror of not knowing what he would do next. At times it was all too much. I would collapse and have to take a few minutes break. But eventually, after hour upon hour, I filed the order and it got approved. It was signed with wet ink and it was stamped. Enough was enough, Derek. You're going to prison if you come back ever again. To support this channel, please leave a like on today's video. Secondly, comment down below. There are two things you can comment. The first one is simply support for me and my channel. The other thing is you can interact with the stories by giving your opinions, criticizing what's happened, or giving advice to the people who were experiencing what happened. It means a lot. I don't ask for donations and I don't sell anything stupid. That's the only two things I ever ask for. If you want to go one step further, then you may be able to share the video on your group chats or your Facebook, but it's totally up to you. If you are new though, be sure to subscribe as I upload every single night, always brand new stories. Thank you everyone, I hope you're well, and I'll catch you all tomorrow.